A painting inside a painting. A picture hidden for over 350 years, now revealed. A Vermeer's painting, Girl Reading a Letter at an Open Window, has been recently restored. Optical techniques allow restorers to identify hidden layers of painting. After the restoration, a picture within a picture, showing a cupid, emerged from the back wall. Not much is known about Vermeer's life. Actually, we know 34 works of his hands, and the majority of these paintings cannot be precisely dated. Johannes Vermeer was born in Delft in 1632, the second son of Digna Belton and Rainier Janssen. The painting, The Procurus, shows the only presumed self-portrait of Vermeer at 24 years old. We have no sure information about Vermeer's training as a painter. At the age of 21, he was admitted in the Guild of St. Luke an organization of artists, artisans, and merchants. To be accepted in this guild, a member had to spend six years as an apprentice. At the same age of 21, Vermeer married Katarina Bunes, the daughter of a well-to-do family. He had been baptized in 1632 in the Reformed Church and probably converted to Catholicism, the religion of his wife's family. The couple lived in the house of Vermeer's mother-in-law, Maria Tins, where the arts had a studio on the second floor. They had 15 children, of which four had died fairly young. Vermeer lived at the Dutch Golden Age, a period in which science art and trade flowered in the Netherlands. Delft was one of the major cities of the province of Holland in his time. 1672, a war began between France and the Dutch Republic. The war triggered detrimental effects on Dutch economy and so on Vermeer's life. The catalogue of an auction carried out in 1696, included some Vermeer's paintings along with other artists' works. The evaluations show that, in his time, Vermeer was highly rated in Delft, although in the next two centuries people did not fully appreciate his genius. Vermeer's painting, Girl Reading a Letter at an Open Window, was recently restored. The restoration process has revealed a hidden framed painting inside the painting, a picture of a cupid on the background wall. The restoration also allows us to see the original lively color palette, far from a dull and gloomy aspect. In 1979, an X-ray revealed an overpainted image in the right top corner of the painting. With naked eyes, it's even possible to see the shadows of a picture's contour on the rear wall. This type of shadow is called a pentimento. It's a trace of a previous painting beneath the more superficial layers of a canvas and it may appear with time due to progressive transparency of some pigments. So, how the experts have concluded that other person, and not Vermeer, decided to cover up the cupid? The analysis of the layers of the painting has showed that underneath the painting that hides the figure, there were layers of dirt. So, ears, in fact, the cage, had passed after the completion of the artwork. 
since it's dated of 1657 to 1659 and Vermeer died in 1675, it was not possible that himself did this job. Another question is why someone decided to overpaint the Cupid picture. The history of this painting may give some clues. It has been in the Dresden Museum since 1742, when it was acquired as being a work by Rembrandt. Only in the 1860s, the painting was finally attributed to Vermeer by Théophile Torreberger, a French journalist who thoroughly studied the 17th century Dutch art. Vermeer had been by them an admired, but not an extensively known painter. It's possible that the overpainting was made so the painting would be sold pricier as a work by Rembrandt. In 2018, a decision was made to remove the overpaint and to reveal the hidden figure. The intention was to come as close as possible to the Vermeer's original work. The restoration initiated with a thorough cleaning of the surface. In this step, the conservator removes old layers of varnish and the dirt that had been adhered onto it. The colors underneath these coats of aged and yellowish varnish are exquisite and seem like they're brand new painted as the canvas has just left the artist's studio. Layers of varnish were removed with solvent wetted cotton swabs. During this process, the restorators were able to see that the paint on the left upper corner reacted in a distinct way, bringing up the question that the overpaint had been applied later. A fine scalpel was used to remove the overpaint, as this was the technique that would best preserve the original layer. We now can see the fully revealed picture of a cupid enclosed by a large black frame. He is standing with a bow, arrows and two masks on the ground, one of them under his foot. Likely, the masks represent pretense. The Cupid is the ancient Roman god of love and is often depicted as a naked child with a bow and an arrow. Paintings within paintings carry a clear connection between the foreground scene and the subjects of the pictures. Three Athens, Vermeer's mother-in-law, owned paintings that Vermeer depicted in his own works, including The Procurers by Jürg van Papuhan and Christ on the Cross by Jacob Jordan. The latter appears in the Allegory of Fate. A similar painting with a cupid is seen in at least the other three Vermeer's paintings. Lady is standing at a virginal in the National Gallery of London. Girl interrupted at her music lesson in the Frick Collection in New York City. And at least a piece of this picture pops up in a woman asleep in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Here, we see just the lower right corner of the cupid. The picture is not strictly the same in the three paintings. Vermeer alters his size, shape and elements. In the inventory of Maria Thin's goods, a painting of the cupid is reported. Maybe that was the source for Vermeer's cupids. It has also been suggested that the cupids in Vermeer's paintings were inspired by the pictures in an emblem book published in 1608, illustrated by Otto van Fien, a humanist artist. In that book, called Amorum Emblemata, Otto van Fien depicts dozens of cupids, 
each of the 124 illustrations goes along a quotation on love. The emblem, too, represents a Latin motto by Aristotle, Perfectus amor non est nisi ad unum. There can only be perfect love for one person, meaning that a lover out of love only one. The cupid here holds a ball and has a tablet under his foot. The emblem 116 with the Latin motto Semper Idem, always the same, shows a standing cupid holding flowers in a position similar to that one observed in Vermeer's painting. The emblem 28 has the motto in concursa fide, with faith unshaken, and also shows a quotation from Cicero, saying, in friendship, there is nothing false, nothing pretended. Here, we also see Cupid with a bow, and now he treads a mask. With a new element, we now must relearn to see a previously familiar painting. Some people argue that the Cupid is too distracting now, or that he reduces the sense of the woman's loneliness. Some say that the work seems to be more cluttered now, as they were used to see a blank space on the wall. And maybe some can argue that the Cupid is a too obvious reference to love. But the presence of the picture was intended by the genius himself. All the elements within the painting suit the ideas he wanted to transmit. A young woman is seen in profile, full absorbed in reading a letter. The young woman holds firmly the paper. Her face is reflected on the glass pane. The girl's head is located exactly at the center of the canvas. She stands by an open window that sheds sunlight on the interior. Particles of bright colors are sprinkled where the light hits the surfaces. These glowing flakes and the way light pours and gentle gradations are hallmarks of the master. Though the figure was well individualized, we don't know her name, as it happens with all other people we see in Vermeer's paintings. We have, at the same time, a sense of intimacy and secrecy. Composition is skillfully planned. Marked linear structures and geometry play important roles in constructing the space and the sense of death. A colorful and elaborated rug covers the table, where a leaning bowl pours peaches and apples outside. Hanging on the right, a curtain is pushed aside, and the viewer gains access to the scene. However, the table prevents the witness to go further. The green curtain in the foreground is not a part of the girl's room. Actually, it's a temple motif created for optical illusion. The curtain at the same time reveals the room interior, but also sets the spectator outside from it. Vermeer made decisions based on his own aesthetic choices and not only on the strict obedience to what he saw. Like the girl's face reflected on the window, the angle doesn't match exactly to her position. Her hairdo and her color don't correspond exactly to the reflection as well. The contours of a lion's head are visible in the work and were confirmed in the infrared image. 
these lions had were carved in chairs that were popular during his time, and they appear in other Vermeer's works. A Roman glass takes shape in the bottom right corner under the X-ray images. Interestingly, by previous studies, we know the pigments the master had used. Lead white, amber, lead tin yellow, vermilion, matter lake, azurite, ultramarine, green earth, and charcoal black. Vermeer offers to people of the later centuries a plunge in a 17th century room along with his own contemporaries and with the objects of their everyday life. Though the scene is carefully constructed, the final result doesn't seem unnatural, but alive. Skillful brush strokes portray the surface with no need of overwork. The effect is lavish, but not overdone. The painting is not just a simple sum of well-elaborated factors. More than this, these elements build up to that unique feeling of a masterpiece. Although an optical device was probably used, the artist registered more than a photographic description. He catches a moment with its feelings and sensations. Not only the viewer see the painter's world, but the figure travels across time and makes herself present in our world. It's a remarkable time capsule inside the frame.